Good afternoon, everyone. I am thrilled to welcome you to this year's Parkmont Poetry Festival. It is our 42nd. And I welcome all the beautiful folks in the room and all the beautiful folks in the Zoomverse. We are live streaming and broadcasting this event. We'll make a recording of it and we can share that with you later. Uh, if you've never been to one of these before, you're in for a treat. Relax, settle back in your pew, and open yourself to the possibility of being changed. I think you'll find the voices and the verses that you hear today have that potential. The poet Ellen Bass believes that that's why we write, in order to be changed. She also thinks it's why we read. I will attest that it's also why we gather and watch and hear art, because it has a transformational potential. Parkmont School is a small independent school just across Blagden Avenue at the corner of 16th for middle school and high school students where we see and celebrate that potential for change every day in our classrooms, on our school adventure trips. And that's why it gave rise to the Parkmont Poetry Festival in 1982. Ron McLean and Judy Lentz started this venture that was kind of like our mission at our school. And our very first judge was Lucille Clifton, Marilyn's own. Thank you for the hoots. It's a big deal. <laughs> I will tell you that her spirit guides every moment of my coordination of this festival. We're very proud of that. I have a lot of folks to thank, and I'm not gonna read all their names, but most of them are in your booklet in the back. And if you need a booklet, don't have a booklet, we'll be selling them downstairs at the reception after the event. All the poets have two. Um, first, I, I wanna thank our founder, Ron McLean, who generously sustains this festival now for 42 years. He is not able to be here, but I know he's out there on Zoom. Ron, thank you for this. We have many wonderful supporters. Two in particular have thrown love at this event from the day I met them. Jackie Michael and David Weissman are just angels uh, of, of this festival. We are so very grateful for their support. Parkmont has an amazing board. They get us, they show up for us. We love our board. In the back of your book, you will see a list of all the teachers who sponsored winning poets. Many more teachers sponsored entries, but these finalist poets may have been nudged or, or uh, helped by a teacher. Every time I read a poem that crosses my desk for submission, I think, gosh, I wish I could be in that person's poetry class. Wow, how great to be their student. We have a cadre of volunteers from Parkmont, staff, kids, parents, board, pulling the levers behind the curtain, making the magic happen. We thank them and our Zion Baptist team uh, up there in heaven, up there in the booth, uh, our, our profound thanks to Eric, to Zaineb, to um, Kevin, and to Shante. They're more than neighbors. Uh, we're, we're more than just proximal <laughs> with our buildings. They're collaborators. I want to say just a quick thing. I was thinking about the courage it takes to write a poem, and then the courage it takes to show it to somebody. And then maybe you upload it on a website for a contest that could select you as someone to come into this room with a really gorgeous rafters and speak that poem to hundreds of people, real or virtual. That's courage, that's conviction. I don't think we see so much of it in our world today. And I wanna say to the poets, I bet you've got some butterflies, but you are doing what many of us could not. 
and we admire you and we salute you. You cannot fail today, you have already won. Uh, finally, we had a dream team of judges who adjudicated this event. Shenandoah Sowash and Maria Fernanda were our semi-finalist judges. Heavy lifting, lots of poems. But we are really blessed today to have our finalist judge, Terry Ellen Cross Davis, here. I know that Terry is as excited to meet the poets whose words she saw, but not their faces, not their voices, uh, perhaps as excited as you are to hear from her. So Terry, um, I don't know where you are out there, but come on down. Oh, hi. <laughs> Oh, yay, there's a little stool for those of us who are vertically challenged. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. I want to say um, thank you, Kim. This was a joy. It was a joy to judge these poems. Uh, I was surprised by the depth and just the variety of imagery and language that you all as poets pulled into your poems to service the poem. And I just wanna say congratulations to you all. And I want to echo something that Kim said. She unwittingly, uh, you know, being right into what I was thinking. And that is, it takes courage to do this. It takes courage to put a pen to the paper and figure out your thoughts and un the spool of them, to let them unspool onto the page and have it make sense. It takes courage to submit that poem for a contest, and it takes courage to get up here and read it. And I want you to know, when you get up here to read your poems, take a deep breath. You've done a lot of the hard work already. Read your poem slowly so we can enjoy it, okay? And I also want to tell you that maybe poetry is a hobby for you, or maybe it's a passion. And if it is a hobby or a passion, continue to do it. It makes so much sense. Poetry soothes the soul. And I am one example of someone who loved poetry and followed it as a passion, and now it's become a career. And how did it become a career? I started a poetry club in high school. I ran a poetry series in a coffee house in college. And now I curate the poetry series for the Folger Shakespeare Library. And it's a full-time job, people. I get to read poetry books every day, all day. I get to meet great poets. We just had Edward Hirsch here the other night. And so I want to tell you, there is a career in poetry and there's a career in following your passion. If you follow your passion in life, you can make it work. And that is exactly what I have done. So I want you to continue to write. And as you write, please read. You heard Kim Schraff mention Lucille Clifton. Oh. It would make my heart sing, and I'm sure it would make everyone's heart sing if you picked up a Lucille Clifton book. Read Lucille Clifton, read Terrence Hayes, read your contemporary poets. Read those people who are writing these poems about this time, this life, this world. And I just wanna say again, congratulations. I look forward to hearing these words come out of your mouths after reading them and sitting with them for so long on the page. You all have done a great job. You all are poets to me, and I hope you continue to write. Congratulations. Thank you, Terry. If you haven't been up here, there's one little thing to navigate. Uh, there's a step stool here for anybody who needs it. Uh, you don't have to stand up on it because you see what happens to my voice. <laughs> so stand just behind it if, if you're of a height and step on up if you need it. So back in the day, somebody said, maybe it would be cool if we had an MC at our festival. And ever since that happened, we have. Ever since we started, it's been Sharon Strange. And I look forward to her return from Spelman down in Atlanta, where she's been grading poetry portfolios every year. Sharon, welcome back. Thank you, Kim. 
Hey, Parkmont community. Hey, DC community. I miss you all, which is why I never refuse the request to come back and MC every year. I've been doing this for many, many, many years now, and I call it one of my favorite joyful acts of poetry uh, that I do every spring. It's National Poetry Month. Um, even though the month is ending in a couple of days, for me, uh, poetry month, poetry year, it continues, continues. So in the spirit of National Poetry Month, I just want to start out by giving out a few shout outs uh, to poets whose birthday anniversaries are this week. And this is just this week alone. Uh, so shout out to Marilyn Nelson, Natasha Trethaway, Damaris Hill, Louise Gluck, Peter J. Harris, Carolyn Forche, and Yusuf Komanyaka, just to name a few um, well-known and well-established poets. Uh, some of them you may have studied. All right, so again, just from this week alone, so I challenge you to find out about poets who, other uh, poets born in the month of May, or just poets that whose uh, voices speak to you. Um, I also want to mention that today, April 27th, is the birth anniversary, the 79th birth anniversary of August Wilson, technically not a poet, but August Wilson, the giant of American theater, whose uh, 10 play series uh, chronicles African American life sp spanning a century, over a century, and is akin to the Homeric epics of ancient times, of Mediterranean life and social upheavals. Um, August Wilson's plays were infused with that existential and aesthetic sensibility that we have come to call the blues. And so speaking of the blues brings me back to poetry and to another poet whose name I want to invoke today, even though he wasn't born in the month of May, uh, Reuben Jackson, Reuben Jackson, the late Reuben Jackson. Um, yes, yes. Uh, who sadly passed away this past February. But Reuben Jackson, who was also a Parkmont poetry judge several times over the years, um, he was a, a DC poet, a, a DJ, a local legend, and really an unofficial poet laureate of Washington, DC. Uh, he worked at the Smithsonian with the Duke Ellington uh, collection. Duke Ellington, by the way, his, his birthday's anniversary is April 29th, so a few days from now. He also taught at UDC. Uh, he was a jazz scholar um, for many, many years, a jazz DJ on public radio, um, and, and jazz and blues sensibility infused Rubin's poems. So I just want to recite a brief excerpt from a poem of his, um, Self-Portrait 1988. He had a very Lucille Clifton-esque style to his poetry. Um, but here's a quick excerpt of his self-portrait. He says, I am stubborn, broke, but mean well, and am trying hard to fuse my passions with the world's conventions. And I think in that brief excerpt, he captures what many of us poets feel at times, and also the challenge of poetry to find our um, passions and to fuse our passions with this world's conventions, and even to challenge this world's conventions through the expression of our passions and poetry. Um, so I think that's a fitting uh, place to leave off in thinking about this occasion, um, hoping that you are all finding your places in poetry, welcoming these young poets um, and their, their budding voices, the community of their teachers, families, friends, um, and this broader community of poetry in Washington, D.C., and the world, past and present, that is ready to embrace them. So welcome to you all, welcome to the poets, welcome to everyone here to support them and to honor the work that they've done. I'm just gonna go right into our program. My role here is to introduce the poets and to uh, say a few words about their poems. So you can follow along. I'm, I'm going to introduce them in the order that they appear in the booklet. So I'm very happy to start us off with, I guess it was maybe a little bit of a synchronicity that I ran into Ariel. Uh, Ariel Stopak in the restroom <laughs> before the program started. So a lovely person, just, and I'm so excited to meet all of you, but first let's bring Ariel Stopak up. Ariel is a ninth grader at Georgetown Day School to share her poem, To Tell the World. <laughs> to 
to tell the world, fall, to tell the world how I truly feel, difficult, strange. If I march to my own drum, who will take away my sticks? If I sing my own song, who will so turn off my music? Wondering won't do me, you, them any good. My voice, quiet, for now. Winter, to tell the world how I truly feel, steady, balanced. If I listen closely, could I hear the beginning of a song? If I sing a note, could I start a crescendo? Wondering won't do me, you, them any good. My voice, a whisper, for now. Spring, to tell the world how I truly feel, fluid, lifted. When I march to my own drum, my beat thump thumps throughout the hallways. When I sing my own song, my music bursts brilliantly for everyone to hear. Wondering didn't do me, you, them any good. My voice, a sympathy. I know that now, I always have. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Ariel. Well done. Um, and I was just noticing there's certain passages in this poem that I especially love, and, and just words that capture it. Difficult, strange, and fluid and lifted. And I feel, again, like those are just almost magical words to talk about that experience of the poet in the world and also within her consciousness. So thank you for that beautiful poem that also ends with the lovely, I know that now I always have, expressing that deep sense of knowing. So thank you so much. We're going a little bit out of order. Um, so I'm asking you to turn to page 39 if you're following along in the booklet for our next winning poet's poem. She is Aria Song, a sixth grader at Sidwell Friends School. Waiting. I was three years old, going to kindergarten for the first time. Different languages. They were different from mine, yet they were the same as each other's. I only knew Chinese, but everybody around me seemed to know English. It was like I was stuck in a deep hole, and everyone else could run around. It felt like I couldn't talk, like I didn't even know how to talk. I was alone, yet not alone, in a large group of people, who thought I was a weirdo because I didn't know how to talk. And when I looked out the window, even the trees were speaking English. Swish, swoosh. They laughed at me as they swayed in the wind. So for the next few months in school, I just listened. I barely spoke and only did when I had to. I just listened. I listened to what people were saying, how they said hi and how they said bye. I just listened. I was patient, waiting for my time when I would talk. And the next month, and the next month after that, I said my first English word. I don't remember what English word I said, but I remember that at that moment, I could talk again. Oh. Thank you. Oh, that was great, Aria, and I love your energy. I love the way you kind of bounced off a of stage just now. Um, so it's interesting to go from Ariel's poem that mentions deep knowing, right? That knowing and always have known. And then to your poem, Aria, where you talk about this deep listening, this deep listening that helped you to grasp the language of English. And now you have grasped another language, which is poetry. So thank you for that wonderful poem. Okay, our next winning poet. So wonderful to have all of these poems that, again, sort of make us think about poetry in, in a um, figurative sense. Betty Getacho is a sixth grader at Sidwell Friends School. So please welcome Betty Getacho. Thank you. As you look at the sun, you may go blind from its glare, as it's judging you for all of your faults and imperfections. But if you glare right back with the same mindset as it, 
you might glow brighter than the sun itself as it cowers in fear. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Um, even though you coached me, I, I apologize for the little s with your name, Betty Gatacho. All right. Oh, so the eclipse, right? This makes me think of the recent eclipse, right? And that whole urge that you have to look at it, look at it, look at it, even though they tell you not to look at it, right? So I have to admit, I did kind of look at the eclipse when I wasn't supposed to. And what it does is it imprints its image on you, right? On your retina. It eventually goes away, thankfully, right? But, um, but that, that relationship of like seeing, right? And fearing, but looking anyway, right? And, and in some way feeling triumphant because you did overcome that, that stare, yeah. So thank you for your poem. I'm not advising anyone to look at eclipses, though, all right, or, or stare at the sun. <laughs> but, but metaphorically, all right. Our next winning poet is Hadil Hamad, an 11th grader at the Paul International High School. Sunsets and sunrise the orange light hitting me and my friend's face on our way to campus. Squinting our eyes from the brightness, it disappears as the darkness takes over. The brightness hitting again, reminding me of the sun rising as I drove over to the beach. The warm air invades my skin, making me love the sun. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that poem, Hadil. Again, thinking about the sun. The sun is such a powerful metaphor, isn't it? It's such a powerful figure um, for just thinking about life and thinking about energy and thinking about relationship and, and connectedness. Um, so thank you for sharing your poem, which reminds us of that. And again, all right, I'm a poet, so I'm kind of geeky about all kinds of things. And sunrises and sunsets, you wouldn't believe the number of photographs of sunrises and sunsets that are on my computer. So I especially appreciate uh, that aspect as well. I want to um, ask students to come a little closer to the mic when you share your poems, uh, especially if you're soft-spoken, uh, so that we get you all the way in the back. All right, thank you. So the next poem, Sorry, is by our winning poet, Everly Geyer, a sixth grader at Sidwell Friends School. Sorry to a sixth grader a hundred years from now. I'm sorry this is what I left you with. Sorry you'll never see a golden butterfly flapping along its elegant wings sweeping across the sky. Sorry you'll never swat a fly off your slice of cake and giggle as it comes back again, a relentless warrior. Sorry you'll never stare into the many eyes of a spider and wonder what they are thinking. Sorry you'll never roll around in the grass and use it, use it as a soft blanket as you dive for a frisbee. Sorry you'll never see a little bug on the floor, take it outside and watch in wonder as it skitters away. Sorry you'll never spend a day shoveling snow, then come home and sip hot chocolate by a cozy fire. Sorry you'll never sit outside and stare up at the stars and wish for a secret hope, a dream, to come true, hidden away like a buried chest of treasure. Sorry you'll never pick a flower and give it to someone super special. Sorry you'll never spend a whole recess spreading seeds and smiling as birds flock to it mere feet from you. I'm sorry you'll never be able to do the things I did. I'm sorry that this is what I left you with this planet too dead to call Earth anymore. And may I tell you that yes, we could have prevented this, believe it or not, yes we could, but we didn't. And so, I must sit here and say, 
I am sorry. Thank you, Everly. I, I want to comment, too, on how well you read your poem. I just love the way that you all are um, just hitting those intonations and those expressions that help us to understand uh, the meaning of your expression, the passion of your expression. Um, and, and this type of poem, this uh, apology, we call it this apostrophe, an apology together, really, um, is so thoughtful and so beautifully done and manages to capture, I think, those aspects of nature that we all need to be stewards of more to, to in, in, a, in a way, nullify the message of this poem, hopefully. But thank you for sharing that. All right, so uh, let's welcome our next winning poet, Chris Settle III, who is an 11th grader at Gonzaga College High School. Failures. In shadows deep where dreams do fade, a life once vibrant, now betrayed. With every step, a stumble, a fall. Echoes of failure, a haunting call. Ambitions lofty, like fleeting mist. Grabs too eagerly, then dismissed. In the tapestry of time, a frayed seam. Weaving tales of a broken dream. A symphony of sorrows, a mournful tune. Played on the strings of a heart, marooned. Hopes lie scattered, like autumn leaves. Crushed by the, wet, crushed by the weight of unmet beliefs. Yet in this lament, a whisper of grace, resilience rising, a steadfast embrace. For in the ruins of what might have been, a chance for rebirth to rise again. Thank you, Chris. Um, again, I'm just, well, every year, I'm just really inspired and encouraged by the, the poems that we hear um, and by these voices of young people, but voices that are so astute, so mature, uh, so really tapped in uh, to life and, and hopeful, ultimately. And so I thank you for that spirit of your poem. Let's welcome our next winning poet, Olivia Hoof, who is a 10th grader at St. John's College High School. This is an audio recording. This is an audio recording. We're going to hear the recording. It'll be worth it. Self-doubt. I will overcome nothing. That means everyone thinks I am a failure. My mind echoes with insecurities. I'd be wrong if I said someone would care. So if I disappeared, that would help make the world better. Think more positively. No one would miss me. I'd be lying if I said I am and always will be enough. I'm a worthless person. No one can make me believe that there is beauty in everyone. I hate the person I see in the mirror. Nothing can make me say I am worth something. Listen to what others have to say about me. I will never be amazing or beautiful or great because one day I will be gone. Those who say bad things about me are right about my worth. My friends don't matter to me anymore. The numbers on the scale prove me wrong. I am perfect just the way I am. I just slide. I scrutinize every blemish and scar. I guess I feel self-doubt. Now, I will read the same words but starting at the bottom. Self-doubt. I guess I feel I scrutinize every blemish and scar. I just lied. I am perfect just the way I am. Prove me wrong. The numbers on the scale don't matter to me anymore. My friends are right about my worth. Those who say bad things about me be gone because one day I will be amazing or beautiful or great. I will never listen to what others have to say about me. I am worth something. Nothing can make me say I hate the person I see in the mirror. There's beauty in everyone. No one can make me believe that I'm a worthless person. I am and always will be enough. I'd be lying if I said no one would miss me. Think more positively. That would help make the world better. So if I disappeared, someone would care. 
I'd be wrong if I said my mind echoes with insecurities. Everyone thinks I'm a failure. That means nothing. I will overcome self-doubt. Thank you. Okay, so this is why we like to do poetry too, right? We get to have fun experimenting with form, right? And there's, there's uh, something really um, delightful about the way Olivia reversed the poem and took us back through it and left us with the enduring message that all humans, and especially poets, right, struggle with self-doubt, we face self-doubt, we face insecurities, but in the end, right, it helps to remember how powerful we are and how much our voices matter. So thanks to Olivia for that wonderful poem. Next we have the winning poet Brielle Carey, a sixth grader at Charles Hart Middle School. Welcome, Brielle. Brielle, chaotic, impure, sharp, and inconsistent. Daughter of a bee and a hornet. Sister of emerald, pearl, and pink quartz. Lover of crafting, Melanie Martinez, and anything so colorful, it's blinding. Who feels hidden under some cheap charade of born clothes and ideas. Who finds happiness in rainbow loom bands, kittens, and here. Even though you fall down the stairs sometimes, I'm the ones who needs consoling, Recon reconnection with my soul, and more puppies. <laughs> who would like to see Melanie Martinez in concert, the downfall of Stranger Things, and baby turtles leaving shore at sunset. This is Brielle, who shouldn't have to hide her chaotic life in mind. Carrie, thank you. Thank you, Riel, for that lovely uh, self-portrait. Yes, um, chaotic, sharp, and inconsistent, maybe, but certainly self-assured and someone I could relate to who also wouldn't mind seeing the downfall of Stranger Things. So thank you for sharing that. Our next winning poet is an eighth grader at Parkmont School with the lovely poem, Ode to My Backpack. Let's welcome Liu Fikru. Oh, to my backpack. I should have said I'm sorry, but I don't think that my backpack would have accepted that. With the way I invade its privacy, my arm becomes a shovel when digging for a pencil. With the way I toss it like a frisbee, knowing it'll crash like an egg with my notebooks and computer as the yolk. With the way it's a bright lilac fades into a rough purple grape that people couldn't even be bothered to name. With the way its brown edges look like a flower after playing Does She Love Me or Love Me Not, as the Jansport logo loses its grip and is only holding on by a thread. With the way the tar-stained backpack straps support the entire operation. Each crease I make brings them to life, and to vertebrates violently screeching in vain, yet they remain staunch soldiers under the terror of my shadow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Liu. That's a lovely poem. And I think about how, uh, as teachers, we often tell our students in writing poems, like you want to think about your subject matter and make the strange familiar and make the familiar strange. And so you managed to do a little bit of both of that in talking about your familiar backpack. So thank you for your poem. Our next winning poem, My Wish, is by Hallelujah Sir Raphael, a 10th grader at the Field School.
My wish. I wish I could be you because my body's covered in mud and muck. My face frequently disguised with dirt and dust. My stomach growls like the roar of a lion. My hunger burns like an internal flame that will never go out yet still. All you care about is what will I wear when I go out tonight? When all I have is this paper thin jacket, so thin you can nearly see my bones beneath it. My bones that are so thin, they could slip right through a closed door. Jacket so thin it can't even keep me warm, warm as this brisk bone chilling winter nears. But I wish I could be you, look at a full plate of food and still complain, have more than enough clothes yet still want something new. Wish the shoes on my feet weren't falling apart, falling apart like the roof above my head, my home not a house more like a shed standing on its very last thread and every night I hope and pray it'll hold together just for another day man I wish I could be you cause so far on my time on this earth the only lesson I've learned is life may never go my way I may not know that mx plus b is equal to y but I know that you and I have completely different lives cause while I live a life you would never want to live you live the dream my entire entire fantasy. Oh, I wish I could be you. Never wonder if my house would collapse on me. Sweep me away with an avalanche of debris. Bury me till I can barely breathe. Crush and break my body like twigs, not bones. But it's funny how if that were you, you've probably got someone to save you. 911 on speed dial to be your hero and rescue. Well, I would have no one to call, let alone my own cell phone. Health care, health insurance, never seen that before. Yet still, I wish I could be you, because clearly you take so much for granted. I could go on and on, tell you these things till the break of dawn, tell you these things till you hear the birds sing. Sing a song of hope for a new day, a new day that for me has never changed, and hope that I lost so long ago. You'd be lucky to catch a smile from me, while every day for you is one filled with joy. Joy that I was never filled with. Hopelessness overcame me, desperation took over me. The pain knowing you were doing so much better than me, it mentally killed me, and as much as I wish I could be you, you don't even know me. You don't even see me. You can never know what I go through. And it's not OK, because believe it or not, it's not just me who feels this way. It's not just me who experiences this pain. There's almost a billion other kids out there just like me, fighting for all of the same opportunities. God knows when we'll be saved from this nightmare. But until then, I guess we'll just be here, here wishing we could be you. Thank you for that poem, hallelujah. Um, thank you for the vulnerability and the honesty of that poem. Um, and the way this poem, like many other poems, captures the voice of those who are treated as invisible, of those who are marginalized, um, as those who, to speak some of the language of the poem, are hanging on by a thread, um, trying to hold up under imminent collapse. Uh, so thank you for such a powerful poem that, uh, that makes us again consider um, why poetry is so necessary, uh, and, and especially um, beyond its more personal uh, aspects, but in terms of a, a broader social consciousness. So it's a powerful poem. Thank you. I want to welcome now our next winning poet, Daphne Easterly Zebley, a 10th grader at the Murray School. The other girl. Every day I see a perfect girl on the street. The one that balances 15 extracurriculars and has exceptional grades maybe. A boyfriend, a proportional body, a pleasing personality. The one that ends up at Harvard effortlessly. And although she is in my path for fleeting seconds, from sunrise to sunset, breakfast to dinner, winter to summer, I want to be her. Go on long walks where jeans that look like they were made just for me and for once be the poem, not the poet, effortlessly. 
I stay up late at night, wishing, wondering, weeping while life goes on without me. But then I question whether it's truly as glamorous, as silky smooth as vanilla icing on a cake. Does she stay up late too? Does her mascara drip down her cheeks? Does she look at her body in the mirror with disdain? Does she regret her Harvard decision? But most of all, do we all stay up at night, infatuated with one another, the other girl who lives a life effortlessly? Thank you, Daphne. Again, another beautiful, astute poem uh, about the interior consciousness. Uh, we think about ourselves, we think about others. We never know how close the gap is uh, or how distant the gap is. Um, and, but thank you for a poem that helps us to realize that, um, that we're all, in some sense, trying to figure each other out, too, as we, as we make our way through life. All right, our next winning poem is by Fiona Johnson, a seventh grader at Alice Deal Middle School, Echoes of Affection. I want to ask if anyone is uh, here to read uh, Fiona's poem, um, because Fiona's not able to be with us today. OK, then we will have Kim read the poem. Thank you. Fiona and I were, were trying to arrange something last minute. She was at an airport in Chicago, <laughs> and I wasn't sure if she had lined up a proxy reader, but I'm very happy to read her poem for her. Echoes of Affection. I crave the exchange of love, the balance of giving and receiving. For every drop of affection I pour into the world, I yearn for an equal measure in return. I scatter seeds of kindness like confetti, each act a will to love within. But as I watch them drift in the breeze, drift into the breeze, I wonder if any will find their way back to me. I long to bask in the warmth of affection, to feel the embrace of love wrapping around me. Yet too often, it feels like I'm standing alone, lost in the vast expanse of my own generosity. I don't seek grand gestures or extravagant displays, just the simple assurance that my love is seen, that it's cherished and prized, that it doesn't vanish into the void, unheard and unseen. So I continue to sow seeds of love, hoping that one day they'll find fertile ground. And in the garden, in my heart, I'll find some abundance of love I've always shared. Thank you, um, Kim, for reading that. And thank you to Fiona for this wonderful poem. I'm just blown away that, by this poem. Um, and it makes me think I would get to invoke Lucille Clifton again um, here. Uh, Lucille Clifton uh, once said her, her definition for poetry that kind of stayed with me is that, um, that poetry is really a mutual act of exchange. And so this poem sort of speaks to me in lines like the balance of giving and receiving um, and, you know, finding abundance in the love that I've always shared. So I just love the way that, again, the poem for me invokes that spirit of poetry, right? That spirit of poetry as one of, you know, exchange, right? Between the poet and the world. Our next winning poet is Hiba Hamad. Hiba is an eighth grader at Paul International Middle School. My favorite place. My favorite place is the beach. It is where I belong. The ocean stands brave and beautiful as I lay on the ground staring at the blue sky, feeling the rocky surface crattling my back. Reminiscing the age of five, where I would find joy in building castles, 
the age where I wasn't afraid to let the sun seep into my already bronzed skin. While feeling the sand in between my toes, feeling the ocean breeze blowing my hair around, a moment of freedom and peace, and the feeling as I lay on the water, feeling as if I'm flying, a release of pain and guilt. Thank you. Thank you, Hiba. I think we can all relate to that, yes, right? And I think we all crave that, right? That feeling of freedom, that feeling of peace. So thank you for so beautifully capturing that sentiment in your poem. I want to call up next to the mic our winning poet, uh, Nora Jifrida, a ninth grader at Sidwell Friends School. The Seekers. On this tire-scuffed road, hemmed by bare muscular trees contorting their limbs, a fading pink sky whose color is almost scraped away. A million other travelers will never utter a word to each other, trapped in their gleaming metal shells. Once there was hope, the clean sharp chill in the air, the focused glow of the sun, its shimmer on the swiftly flowing water. Now they chase mirages, the burning glare of the road signs, the dazzling flash of the evening sun on a skyscraper, glass climbing up and up and up, so easily shattered. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Oh man, that is such a stunning poem and so powerful in its images. Um, so I, I know I will, you know, I'm just getting to hear you all and read these poems for the first time here, but I know I'll go back and reread this one several times with that, that um, beautiful imagery, that haunting imagery, I should say, um, and especially that ending, right? So again, thank you for such a, such a stunning um, and accomplished poem. Let's welcome now our next winning poet, Ava Beckman, a ninth grader at the Field School. All right, we're going to change up a little bit. We'll get to Ava in just a moment, all right? But I'm going to invite next to the mic Max Morty, a seventh grader at Sheridan School, with his poem Nigeria. Nigeria, kids running under the shade of graffiti lined concrete bridges, hosting soccer matches, roadsides lined with cars, bumper to bumper, a cacophony of horns honking, a sea of people darting across roads with faded traffic markings as cars weave like cheetahs and diesel fills the air. Nigeria, rays bouncing off rusty cars, soaking into the black windows. Determined street hawkers selling goods to captive drivers, catching them with paintings and chocolates. A bright blue sky replaced by an ocean of sandy gray, blown in from the Sahara's sands. Nigeria, gatherings for joy, gatherings for sorrow. A family, a tribe, each connected by a land. Strands of coral weeds and tangy oranges and sky blues. Nigeria, my ancestral home where my DNA was crafted, so different from what I'm used to, so different from where I live. DC is my home, Nigeria is my homeland. Woo! 
Thank you, Max. And I love the energy with which you read that poem. Like you, you really made us feel your connection to Nigeria. Um, and I love the vivid cinematic quality of the first part of your poem. And then it sort of takes us inward into your consciousness and your connection to your homeland. So thank you for such a beautiful and accomplished poem. All right, Ava, you ready? So now we have Ava Beckman. A broken mirror. You look at me through a broken mirror. You see what I let slip, what I paint for you. No one sees the full me, and sometimes I wonder if I do. You, I used to let you see that which I didn't even know was there. But when my mouth lay open, the fruits of my troubles rest in your lap. I'm waiting for your approval. Seldom, but sometimes, you mold a blade of my words, of which you break the soft, pale skin on my back. Sometimes I wish I could let you in, let you feel the uncharted waters, the divine and savage wood of which we call the human mind. But if I do, will I have nothing left? Will my oceans dry with every drop of bl blood that falls from the skin on my back? Or what if it's everything I've ever dreamed of? I can explore the savage divinity of your wood and feel the pulse of your oceans against my feet. And you could do the same. And maybe you could understand me, something I can't even do after trying for 15 years. Thank you, Ava. Uh, again, I'll mention just the, the vulnerability of some of these poems and just, it's just wonderful how you all have learned to use language uh, to lay bare some of your longings as, as well as some of your wounds. Um, and just some of the language of the poem here, again, it just uh, catches my breath just to hear and read some of these words. Um, and so again, thank you for sharing this, uh, this work with us. And, um, and I, again, hope you continue uh, to write. To, I, I say this for everyone, but uh, I, despite some of the difficult subject matter. I hope you continue uh, to find uh, this expression in poetry that is so meaningful for all of us. So our next winning poet is, uh, and please forgive me if I mispronounce your name, but Aya Teti, an eighth grader at Center City Public Charter School in Brightwood. Mm -hmm. but uh, they're not here yet. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll circle back. So let's go uh, next to um, Aguirre Bebel, an 11th grader at Sidwell Friends School. Naturalization Oath. I hereby declare to live and die for the promise of a nation unattained, a freedom song written in lyrical falsehoods. To seek purpose in an aimless pursuit, never once questioning whether the destination truly justifies the journey. I pledge allegiance to the flag, red as the blood-soaked soil of the stolen land, white as the bones buried six feet under hills of forgotten history, blue as an ocean salty from ever-flowing tears. Star-spangled dreams eclipsed by stark reality, illusory, uh, illusory as a mirage in the desert. The way one can bear true faith and allegiance to a state where truths are self-evident only for some. To kill for peace and divide for unity. To support autocracy in the name of democracy. Working harder for less, aching limbs and heavy heart. And is this justice? Mind struggling to align with the tongue in its foreign abode, twisting and contorting into each painstaking syllable. The way one can say neighbor and really mean enemy. When borders are not nature born, but man-made. When equality is both the sentence and the reprieve. So tell me once more what it means to be a citizen. Thank you.
Thank you, Aguirre. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I can't, I can't really follow that. I mean, I think the poem says it. It says what it needs to say. Um, and it reminds us again uh, that poetry is also about the business of unmasking. It's about the business of uh, challenging and revealing truths that we may not want to hear. Um, so thank you for that powerful poem, Aguirre. And now I invite to the mic our next winning poet, Duy Nguyen, an 11th grader at Jackson Reed High School. Migraine, definition. The devil that rings as a reminder that many still need to work every day with no end in sight. That is a common symptom for us migrants when we stress about our standing ground, our slippery voices, and our pocket-sized authority. For we carry it across continents, preparing the world for another black death of interlopers. Such symptoms do not go away. Even with my grandma's magical lotion, as she rubbed my stomach with it to polish and blast me before the plain leap of destiny, or whenever I seem to just have a normal ache, but it is just that desire to live has no place within the center of migration, especially when you are about to get shifted on the plane of white promises to a hometown of a stranger land that does not prescribe on how to deal with the migraine when it rip apart your roots tripping the ankles of your culture, distancing it far away from the airport when you last took your flight here. Your heritage disappears within your life of work. Your Jack the Ripper identity dilute into the toxic city air that you breathe in instead of your hometown. Then, where is homeland now when the migrant still strides, flying between the wires of stability and poverty? hurting our essence through each of the migrant swing, breaking many, such as job opportunities, the thought of not being uprooted again, actually fitting in, a cozy home, authentic food, healthcare. We are like porcelain, broken on the ring. We migrants are in a never ending war to reach higher than our current place on the hierarchy. One look at our muddy faces and you can see how the migrant fumble features and pass on, swinging on the chains of our ancestors as we wear them every day. We even try to hide it, the migraine, through hard work and detachment. But we all know, migraines can never be unglued when the damage is everywhere. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, uh, thank you, Dewey. I was, you know, it's it's wonderful to hear the the poems and the succession and to and to catch the echoes and to catch the relationships among the poems. And I was thinking about, you know, that mentioning of homeland uh, took me back to Max's poem and and um, and made me think as well as Aguirre's poem. There are just so many ways that you all are speaking in these poems, these intimate truths but also these larger collective truths and understandings. And just, you know, some of the lines in your poem that, that I really love, the plain leap of destiny, um, flying between the wires of stability and poverty and, and how migraine, the migraine fumbles features. It's just, it's just again, um, just lovely to hear uh, that astute expression of ideas and feelings. So thank you for that poem. Yeah. My pleasure. Our next one in poet is Jacob Roberts. Jacob is an 11th grader at Parkmont School uh, who also won last year. So welcome back, Jacob. I wish I had a sweater, the only thing I need. Things would be better, my heart wouldn't bleed. With silent whispers, if I had a sweater. Looking for my sweater, I'm yearning for my warmth. Seems impossible to find, still waiting on my true north. 
Maybe it's all in my mind. But if I had a sweater, if I had a sweater in the dark of the night, when the trees dance and sway and only a glimpse of moonlight, when my sadness comes to stay, when I'm whispering wishes only heard by the breeze, when I'm sitting in silence, if I had a sweater, I'd have a moment of ease. Oh, how a simple sweater would make things so much better. Would help me not remember that one dirt December. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, there's a kind of sly quality to this poem that I really appreciate and actually made me think of Reuben Jackson. I mean, it's just it's the quality of some of his poems. It seems simple, sparely stated, but then there are these deeper truths and understandings underneath it. And then oftentimes that, that ending, that turn at the end sort of shifts us into unexpected space, taking us even a little deeper emotionally. So thank you for your poem, wonderful poem. Let's invite our next winning poet to the mic. Sahana Altavot is a sixth grader at Sidwell Friends School. Ten Thousand Branches. Why does the weight of 10,000 branches always come crashing down on my shoulders? Bend, not break, they say. But what if it's too heavy? What if it snaps? The pain of each snap seeps in like a wine-stained dress, numbing my body against my own touch. As I listen to all 10,000 branches come, come, come crashing down like a bang on the door, begging me to open up. Thank you. Thank you, Sahana. I think there are a lot of us that can relate to that feeling expressed in your poem. So um, the 10,000 branches and sometimes the 100,000 branches, right? Um, so hopefully that weight has been lifted through the writing of the poem. Next, we have Maya Rubin. Maya is a seventh grader at Sidwell Friends School with her poem, Bird Watching. Bird Watching. I saw a dead bird on the sidewalk, eyes shut and skin pink and I stopped to look because. It lived a life of simplicity. It didn't slam doors and yell. Not everything has a feeling. Some things just have a timeline. Wake, eat, sleep, die. A life without any awareness of its eventual unmovingness. Only alive until it's only dead. Because in a world where we wince at the newspaper, a dead bird can make you stare. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Um, I should also say that Maya was also a winner last year. So congratulations on your winning poem this year. Um, and again, I think about the way that the poem takes a turn from the, just from the title, right, into the first line of the poem. It upends our expectations. Um, when I first saw the title, of course, I was ready for that, you know, that kind of pastoral poem, right? But, but here we have a poem that, again, thinking about the economic uh, and um, climate crisis that some of the earlier poems gave, uh, gave us some, um, ways to think about this poem is in keeping with that. I think, again, awareness, that astuteness um, that poets are experiencing with this changing world um, and looking at the things that are hard for us to look at. So thank you for that poem, Maya. Our next winning poet, Angelina Mara, 
An 11th grader at Paul International High School is unfortunately not able to be here to read the poem. Uh, so we have asked Parkmont student Amin Bakari uh, to read Angelina's poem. Petal. The trace you leave behind feel unfamiliar. Droplets invade my eyes when I see you. Petals break off the stem as the breeze blows against you. I can't stop the emotions. Brightness turns to darkness, just like petals. Thank you, I mean, for reading that poem. And thanks to Angelina uh, for, again, writing such a sharp little poem, right? It has this real epigrammatic quality, sort of a um, quality like a haiku, right? Where that, that image of nature um, is placed before us, but given a different angle, given a different way to think about it, uh, a different way to capture um, the feelings that maybe, again, uh, undermine, but are also necessary to help us see uh, some of these things that we idealize, uh, but to see them in different ways. So again, I'm just, um, I'm reminded of how every time I come here, and the reason I come here is to just be uplifted um, by the many ways that students surprise us and delight us um, and make us think with these poems. So our next winning poet is Xavier Lang. Xavier is a 10th grader at Parkmont School. Unfortunately, Xavier will not be able to read his poem today, so we've asked his classmate, Miriam Rose, to read Xavier's poem. The Crimson, Ruby Red Tomatoes, rush upwards, red rag of the Canadian flag. In the basement lies a ruthless red rat covered in blood, resembling mud. A flood of blood, radiant ruby rabbit. Red hot molten metal turned to crimson ash, radiant red sunset. The red raven flies, a red hazardous stop sign like ruby red blood. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, and uh, thanks to Xavier for that poem. Again, a way to um, use imagery in such a striking way, uh, and to use these uh, metaphors and uh, symbols in such a way to help us appreciate something that we maybe, again, think about in a more mundane way. Colors are all around us. Um, my students this past semester uh, have been uh, looking at uh, the literary fragment. This sort of makes me think of um, Maggie Nelson's book, Bluettes. I don't know if you all are familiar. It's a book that is obsessed with the color blue. And so uh, it's a book that has hundreds of fragments uh, all focused on the color blue. This poem brought that to mind. Um, and Xavier approaching it color in his own way. Our next winning poet is Kimberly Pereira Alvarez, a seventh grader at Center City Public Charter School in Brightwood. You can just hold it. Would that be good? Or do you want to use, um, do you want to use this? Hello, hello. Yeah, that might be good. Yesterday the rain tried to eliminate my hands. By running down your body, I ripped the sky part for allowing it. The planks of wood sniff in their boxes, yawning to be nailed up, but neither of us gone, 
goes back to tell them it is over in time. Maybe we're, we're all looking at it. Wrong we think is something search for out there. Show me a picture. I want to see the face of the woman. What day was it and what excuse did feed me? I used to thank the universe for bringing you to me, said the moon and the new day carrying the show. Must go on the set the sun, life drags you by the legs. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, and well done. I love this poem. I think this is a brilliant little poem. This is a brilliant poem, and every stanza in it feels like a new poem, and it feels like um, that real sense of poetry that Emily Dickinson described is like feeling the top of your head blown off because it just opens your mind up to seeing things and experiencing things in a new way. So thank you for that, Kimberly. Our next winning poet, is Jed Miller. Jed is a sixth grader at Sidwell Friends School. Too many names. Are there too many names? They link you to the past. The past that gives you the heart to go another day. The past that pushes you beyond the limit, slowly. Just enough to see the sun, but not enough to reach out. The names that connect us, the names that adore us, the names that give our ancestors hope for the future, the names that want us to keep going, the people, all the ones that kept us on the road to tomorrow, the ones who encourage us to keep going, love us. So when you ask yourself, too many? No, never enough. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great poem, Jed. And I love this, um, where you say the names that connect us, the names that adore us, right? I just love that reminder of the connection of lineage, the connection of generations, uh, the connection going back, back, back infinitely to the source and forward, forward, forward. And so I'll just put this in the context of today. Um, the tradition of poetry, right? All those names, yours among them. Thank you for your poem. Our next winning poet is London Plight. London is an eighth grader at Charles Hart Middle School. Confidence. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will break my confidence. Words will break my trust. Words will linger in my head until who I am becomes who I was. They say words won't make me bleed, that words won't scrape my knees, but the words, but words will make me touch rock bottom, drown in my tears, created seas. Thank you, London. Um, yes. Oops. Right. Hoping I haven't broken the mic. Um, yes, it's, it's a good reminder again of the power of words, but the power of words to break us, but also to make us. So, uh, so I hope you continue to revel in the use of words through poetry um, to build that confidence. Our next winning poet is Christian Lafleur, a sixth grader at Sidwell Friends School. Some people call it. Hey, Christian, I'm going to pull this out for you, so it's not so awkward. <laughs> Let's make sure you're comfortable first. That looks good. Some people just call it a piece of paper and throw it away, but some people call it a piece of work. First fold, still almost nothing. Second fold, gets a curious form. Third 
fold, you now have a foundation, an explicit fold and mouth full of cold and innocent step that ceases in planes, cranes, or elephants. Fourth fold, making progress. Fifth fold, no turning back. Sixth fold, people now think you hacked. So little in view, small. Tenth fold, a small gets bigger. Twentieth fold, gets very detailed. Thirtieth fold, now, then you can see the true of folds. Thank you, Christian. It's a wonderful art origami. And I also think about, of course, how it's a perfect metaphor here, or I should say it's a perfect symbol of the act of writing poems. Now, thank you for your poem. Our next winning poet is Mary Gillen. Mary is a 10th grader at St. John's College High School. Unfortunately, not able to be here today, so we will have Amin Bakari read Mary's poem. Six feet. Six feet is not that far, the length of a table, half of a car. Six feet tall is my father's height, the length of my dog leash. It's not that far, right? Six feet is the distance from my sister's bed to mine. I can move six feet in almost no time. Six feet is half of a Volkswagen Beetle, the length of my torn blanket to be fixed with a needle. Six feet is the space from your body to mine as we reach for each other, our hands intertwined. Six feet is a family, two parents, one child, whether healthy and strong or sick for a while. Six feet makes the family of three go to two. It feels close till the six feet affects you. Six feet where the sick father goes, you think it's not real till the coffin door close. Six feet is a li lifetime away, the furthest distance of all, some might even say. Thank you, Amin, for reading uh, Mary's uh, very poignant poem. Our next winning poet, is Ria Deshmukh, a sixth grader at Sidwell Friends School. Ria is also not able to be here, so we have asked Miriam Rose uh, to read Ria's poem. Fighting just a smile. My memories of you are limited, but I do remember the light that shined in your eyes, no matter the occasion, and the way you fought until the end, fought just to smile, to express your unconditional love to us before your final moment. Sometimes at night, I find your smile in the stars and the sor sorrow morphs into a steady stream of tears, which I know you would gently wipe. If you are still here with me, but then the topic of your resilience flies into my mind, and I think, how, of, I think of how, even when you've lost it all and you couldn't recall the precious moments we had shared anymore, you fought just to smile. And so I did, too. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, uh, for Ria's, uh, reading Rita's beautiful poem. Again, another poignant poem. I see uh, the connection between that poem and the poem uh, we just heard before. Our next winning poet is Miles Paul. Miles is a 12th grader at Parkmont School. It's hard to put emotions into words. Years of thoughts, feelings onto a single page. 
Everyone, everything you say just doesn't come out right. Bottled up emotions create a cave in your heart. You step inside. It feels safe here. Not having to step out and relive your past, you have been keeping in. You don't want your boiling emotions to spill out in sadness or worse, anger. Your response to everything is, I'm just tired. You feel like a burden, like you're not good enough. Am I a bad person, you think to yourself? Everyone has their own troubles. Why are mine so important, you think to yourself. But people care about you. Love is too strong for you to think that you are not deserving of it. There will be dark days, there will be lonely moments, but that is what hope is for. Thank you, Miles. Um, again, a very accomplished poem, and I think your poem speaks to a feeling that a lot of your peers, this generation, that we are talk, calling the post-pandemic generation in some, some places, um, how you capture that resilient spirit that at least adolescents, but not just adolescents, some of these external things uh, have forced you all to face. So thank you for capturing that in your poem. Our next winning poet is Violet Higley. Violet is a ninth grader at Washington International School. I'm thinking, there's a problem I'm trying to solve. I am staring blankly at the wall. I am thinking, there's a problem I'm trying to solve. Click, click, crack. The wall breaks. I am thinking, there's a problem I just cannot solve. I am thinking, I'm fully immersed in the wall. I am thinking, I'm just thinking about the wrong things at the wrong time and place. I am thinking, I'm just dozed off, seeing logistics in my mental space. I see times, dates, lists, names, characters, and I used to be all of them. Memories, memories of walking through a playground, speaking out loud to myself. Back then, it was so much more real. Black sting heroes, the world inside my head, the world that flooded through my mind just as I went to bed. Ask anyone who knew me then, because they'll tell you the truth. I played no other games. I thought no other thoughts than that of the layout of Forsey's flower-shaped home made out of lavender force fields than of the exact order of events of every hero's rise to glory. And after each, there was another. Every time I knew I loved her, I was her. It was normal. I was walking along, talking along to myself. He asked if I was practicing lines for a play. When was the first time you were self-aware, started to care what they thought? This was mine. And now that I'm older, reminiscing the days when I was bolder, reorganizing for the 10th time that month because new plans kept breaking into my mind. Oh, the things I find. I find papers of those whose lives I fabricated. Although they are quite dated, they still touch my soul. And now, as I try to fall asleep, it comes back to me. Schedules of girls my age I wish I could be. A match, a spark, a fuse, a flame, a fire, eternally burning me from the inside out and I'm forced to write crazy schedules of made up strangers before I can close my eyes. I open them, they're gone. My mind is good as new. My day seems pretty normal and through the rest of it, I flew. I'm sitting down in class, staring at the wall. Just one click of a pen and then through the wall again. Thank you. Thank you, Violet. Uh, again, another really accomplished, really astute poem. I love so much the way the poem works like the mind's workings uh, and also helps us to think about that connection with thought, cognitive thought and imagination, that kind of war that goes on oftentimes, right? But well done, thank you. Our next winning poet is James White who's in grade 12 at Gonzaga College High School. Every Sunday, in response to Henry O. Tanner's painting, The Banjo Lesson. Every Sunday after church, you would teach me a routine agony 
your wrinkled hands guided me to the chestnut board. And when minutes turned to hours, and when flinched fingers retreated from sharp strings, you would force me to continue. And when the crimson liquid oozed on the plain white canvas, you forced me to continue. And when the tears showered the blood clean, you forced me to continue. When several Sundays caused your grip to fade and your voice to diminish, I didn't mind. It was a comforting relief. Every Sunday when you could no longer give me lessons, I would play on my own. Every Sunday when you could no longer hear my progress, I would play for the unknown. Every Sunday when you could no longer breathe, my banjo must continue your tone. Every single Sunday, I play for joyous crowds with tears in my eyes, longing for one more Sunday when I would sit on your lap and you would teach me to play. Thank you. Thank you, James. That's such a wonderful poem. It's one of my favorite kinds of poems, an ecrastic poem, right? A poem about a work of art. And this is such an amazing, beautiful work of art. Ecrastic poems help us to uh, describe works of art, but they also help us to imagine their meaning and even to place ourselves within that work uh, in the way that you have done so beautifully here. So thank you. Our next winning poem is by, oops, there's a skip. I was about to announce Aria again. <laughs> All right, our next winning poem is by Zakias Zito, who also won last year, yay, Zakias, a 10th grader at Parkmont School, come on up. School. As, as the clock ticks and the wind blows, I find myself lost in thought. My mind on hold, for the door stares back at me with its big eye, as if it's mocking me in my cell. As I am jailed with longing to be freed, but for now, I am imprisoned. As a teacher milks the time for all it's worth, making me feel like a prisoner on this earth. As the week comes to an end and the weekend comes, as the cycle repeat again on Monday. Thank you, Micchaeus. This, uh, this might be a statement too related to your poem. I feel your pain. <laughs> from, the, from the teacher's side, the other side of the desk, we feel your pain. <laughs> so there's an option. So there's an option to, uh, to use the handheld if this does not want to behave. <laughs> and if we can hear that one. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, our next winning poet is Leila Adebutu. Leila is a seventh grader at the British International School. Sweet tooth. I have a sweet tooth, it aches. Yeah, it's very weird. Do you want to try without the stool? And let me see if I can anchor this for you. You know what? Do you mind? No, I don't Thank mind. you. <laughs> Good. I have a sweet tooth. It aches. Remembering the delicate taste. I'm going to stop you again, Layla. We want, we want a, a straight through read, and Eric is going to help us. <laughs> That looks Here. good. Take a breath. I have a sweet tooth. It aches, remembering the delicate taste, like cherries ripe on my tongue. Swore that I'd only take one. Yet one turned into four, wishing I'd savored it more. Greed consumed more than I did. Greed left my taste below blinded. Hungry, I remain still. Sugar, it just did not fill the hole that I call my heart, but oh, they were just so tart. I want to feel something soon in my mouth, lonely as seed, 
hard and bitter, utterly repulsive. Hatred burns inside me until a new fire ignites. Spit it out. On the floor it lies, as worthless as the ground, alone of no importance, but together, there's purpose now. With this grows more cherries, and soon I'll have a tree. Maybe it takes longer, but earth is bittersweet. I'll pick them all by hand, fruits of my labor sweet. No more poison in them, because they're part of me. I still hold moments dear when there's pulp around my teeth, now taken in moderation to avoid the cavities. I have a sweet tooth, and so I'll live a life one day where I can satisfy it without suffering decay. Thank you. Thank you, Layla. Uh, I think many of us can relate to that poem too. Uh, when it came to the turn in the final uh, stanza, uh, I really felt like the poem resolved itself nicely because yes, we want, we want the sweetness, we want the joy, but we don't wanna be undone by it, do we? So thank you for that poem. Our next winning poem, Freedom, is by Azel Mejia. Uh, an eighth grader at Center City Public Charter School in Brightwood. Freedom, freedom, noun. Having the power or right to speak or do with their own choices. As in, mom doesn't let her daughter speak. Daughter tries to speak with her own voice, but mother ignores her and keeps talking over her, making her daughter invisible like she's not there. That's why she needs freedom. As in, but what if a mom who won't let her daughter explore and have the chance to see the real world? But the real world can be a big bundle of things that you might get tangled into, not able to, not able to get out that's why freedom is, free, that's why, oh, sorry. Freedom can be confusing. As in, she may seem strict or even unfair, but her love is deep and she truly, she truly does care, making sure you are safe, but her but mother has decided to give you freedom so you can explore the real world. Thank you, Azel. Uh, yes, again, uh, these themes of freedom that come, surface again and again in poems, certainly something that a lot of us are concerned about uh, at your age, a lot to contend with when dealing with parents, right? But again, as you say, who care for you, and the freedom is one that uh, will be cherished because it has been uh, allowed you to choose for yourself. Our next winning poet is Jamila Summers. Jamila is a, an eighth grader at the Charles Hart Middle School. Oh wow, I'm tall enough for the mic. <clears throat> Young, free, and smart. I know I don't know much, well, not as much as you, I don't understand the joy of plain living or the useless of things, but being young is a pleasure. Taking the first steps of time, creating a new history, we may not know all, but that doesn't mean we are empty-minded. We understand a lot. As you think your final thoughts and walk your final walks, read this and know the future is bright, not brainless. Thank you, Jamila, uh, and well read. I, I just, I loved your, hearing your voice. I loved hearing the, the energy and the confidence of it as you uh, read that poem. And so again, I wanna encourage you to keep using that voice, that young, free, smart. Well, you won't be young forever, but you'll, you can certainly be free and smart for as long as you decide. So congratulations on your poem. 
Um, before we, we come now almost to the end of the program, before we uh, hear the final poem, I wanted to circle back uh, to see if Aya uh, is here. Is it Aya Teti? I'm sorry, let me get to that page, but we skipped uh, earlier. Uh, Aya Teti, are you here? All right, is someone willing to read the poem from, uh, oh, are you? Are you Oh, how on earth did we do that again? Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Your yeah. I'm so sorry. We're doing this Dr. Cole thing. We have to hear pomegranates. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think we, I think we called for, I think we called for you and weren't sure if you were here. No, oh, I here. see. Uh, this is on page twenty-six. You're on. With our okay. Pomegranates. The enjoyment of a pomegranate is not something that needs to be rushed. It is a gentle, misunderstood fruit. We must pretend to know what it says. Each shallow cut into the shell, each careful tug to reveal the iridescent insides, watching the jewels be pulled from the stringy white flesh. The process is time consuming and is one of the most beautiful feelings. We stand and struggle. We watch the fruit bleed onto the wooden counter. To see something so misunderstood leaves such a permanent, broken mark. We breathe in, inhaling the aroma. A forest, a flower, a tree. The skin is tough, blocking others from accessing its garnet fruit. Squeeze it, they said. Squeeze it and it will break. You do not squeeze it. You cut it open, revealing the clusters of jewel-like seeds. They are surrounded by translucent, membranous pockets. The pomegranate is pure, yet as flawed as the love of Hades and Persephone. My dad would peel a pomegranate for me, but use it as a way to draw me back. Drag me to the hell from which I came, I scream. He does not listen. The pomegranate is a joyful fruit. The pomegranate is seasonal, a specific memory. The juice will stain forever. It will never leave. My mom teaching me to cut it, my dad watching with disdain. My mother held my hand the first time I had a pomegranate. Be careful, for this is the fruit of love. She pulled me into a hug. She showed me how beautiful love was from the start. I failed to listen. I wish I had. The pomegranate is not meant to be mutilated. It is meant to be carefully taken apart with love. The love a mother has for her child, the love a flower has for the sun. We peel a pomegranate the way a mother tucks her child into bed. We peel a pomegranate the way the sunflower turns to face its only true match. We listen to the pomegranate. We hear it beg, we hear it scream with every touch. So we make sure that each touch is full of love. Each touch leaves a mark that isn't a bruise. A pomegranate is beautiful, messy, and raw. It is kind, gentle, and desired. It is patient and rewarding. I am a pomegranate, and you are the one to peel me. I feel your hands strip me and pull out each individual seed. I do not scream or complain. This is different from the other times I was opened. It is a touch of love, not of greed. Thank you. Okay, um, so my apologies to you, Fen Oshman. I am so sorry. I think I just had pages stuck together and skipped right past. And so it would have been criminal for us to have missed hearing you read such a wonderful poem. Um, and, and it's funny because I love pomegranates. I've written of pomegranates myself. I love the, you know, some of the lines in your poem about it being a joyous fruit. One of my friends has a novel called Pomegranate and talks about that, that fruit that reminds us of a heart in its many chambers. So your poem evoked that again for me, and I'm sure we all enjoyed it. So thank you. Yeah. Um, let's, let's have Kim come up and read um, Aya's poem. Thank you. Thank you. I know we were expecting Aya, so I want to do one more. Hello. No, okay. Well, we should hear the poem, Awe, to the best of my research. Awe. Awe, the language and culture in Togo and spoken language in a few other countries in Western Africa. The language that no one knew about because some people never heard of it, 
and other certain people thought the official language of Africa was African-ish. Anyway, the culture that my family grew up with throughout the years of our lives. Ewe, incredible and complex dances that even if you tried, it would make you look as if you were doing the chicken dance. Trust me, it has happened and has ended in tears. The tradition with the music that is sung by a bunch of uncles that have no hair and hide their heads with hats. Ewe, the culture that decided to name me after the day of the week that I was born Ask me what my name means, I'm gonna say Thursday. Anyway, the culture and identity that only I know and cherish because I'm the only West African in the, this class. Sometimes I feel unique, and other times I still feel unique. Anyway, language spoken in Togo and other Western parts of Africa, the language that I admire and live by. Thank you, I'm gonna bring us home. We're at the final poem. Uh, Raza was not able to be here, and I am gonna read for her. There's a bit of language in the poem that I'm not gonna say, and a lot of joy. And Raza, I will try to do justice to this awesome poem. Whole. Pakistan Zindabad. In Urdu, Pakistan's national language, that means long live Pakistan. It's starting to become clearer to me, Raza, that my half white ass is also half Pakistani. I could say half different, half Muslim, half brown, half dotted, half effing abnormal in the blessed United States of America, half Pakistani. And so it's comical, come that special time of year, when the smells of, when the sounds of, when the sights of, when the most attention-seeking emotions of, when it all courses through my blood, then that's when I know that I've arrived in Pakistan, when the feeling can't escape me, when I know that I'm truly whole. I feel it. When the smells of Galreza's French toast seep deep into our noses, I feel it. When the sounds of Urdu, soft but mostly loud, is spoken, with those traces of English, a piercing scream to your ear, felt so strongly, it's the sun blinding your eyes as soon as you glanced at it. You don't like English. You like Urdu, Urdu and Pakistan, because it's you, it's natural. So when the sights of the most grandest and beautiful mountains of Gilgit and Natya Gali creep deep inside your eyes and the palpable emotions of all your hundred relatives are collectively never listened to because your relatives are always yelling at each other, laughing with each other, dancing with each other, and crying with one another, buried solidly as concrete in one another's arms. It's only then when your house fills with music and your eyes with fairy tales and your nose more emotions than smells and your heart with Pakistan, that's when you know you're whole. Oh, okay. It's not done yet. <laughs> We have one more poem, uh, Isabel. Did we miss your poem? What, what is our problem up here? Please come forward and share the mountains with us. Uh, again, with our apologies. She's gonna be worth waiting for. There you go, sorry. Mountains big with purpose, the sky full of limits to break and me, a person full of imagination. Thank you.
Yeah. yeah. Of course. Okay. Uh, again, my apologies, Isabel. I think I got a little thrown off by the flipping to Aria, and then I was supposed to come back to you. But I think that was a wonderful poem for us to end on. Um, you know, short and sweet, um, but surprisingly, well, not so surprisingly, you all aren't surprising at all in terms of your, the beauty of your poetry, but fittingly uh, deep in terms of characterizing all of your peers, uh, all of you 40 winners this year and every year for the festival. And again, just a tribute to poetry itself. So thank you all. Thank you, uh, all of you um, poets, for your work. Thank you for being here through, our, um, through your successes and our gaffes. Uh, we have more donuts, cupcakes, gorgeous pastries with and without gluten downstairs than uh, you can shake a stick at. But before I invite you to a reception, I want to say a very brief announcement. Um, gosh, I'm thinking about our first poem, Telling the World, Your Voice, a Symphony. When do, when do you ever feel that? Maybe not in a lifetime. Maybe it takes a lifetime before any of us can say, yep, I'm whole, I'm complete, it's all there. Uh, but these are opportunities to do that kind of reflection at the age of 12 or of 18. And we need your support to keep doing the Parkmont Poetry Festival. Uh, we have a, a gloriously generous donor who has offered to match gifts up to $10,000, <laughs> up to $10,000. So your $10,000 gift uh, gets us 20. Um, is that how it works? <laughs> your five gets us 10. Uh, please think about sharing a little bit or a lot uh, with our festival. There's a QR code in your book or find any one of us, anybody in a, in a volunteer t-shirt, um, we would be we would be happy to welcome you into the fold. Uh, thank you, poets. Thank you, judges. Thank you, teachers. Thank you, families. If you can, come downstairs and, and mingle. We'll have a little, little community in the fellowship hall. Thank you. <laughs>